I was uncomfortable because I'm not a very good bad cop. Everyone's streaming. Just so you know, there is no coffee in the space. There's no coffee in the space. Um, and thank you so much, but please, that's why we give you breaks. Indulge um, and stay caffeinated um, or hydrated, whichever lifestyle you prefer. Um, so now we're, we're switching gears, but not... Um, not uh, not beyond what we learned earlier in the first session, but in addition to and in context of, right? So that first session gave us such a beautiful lens of legal compliance, recentering our understanding, and now we have the privilege of engaging with individuals who have um, actively engaged with creative solution building, solution generating within their own organizations. Um, and I am going to introduce them quickly and then we will start with share outs um, because I have pictures for everyone on this panel. I'm very excited about them. Um, so first we have Ed Stallsworth, who's the Director of Operations of New 42 Studios. Um, then we have Devin Berkshire, who is the Director of Fieldwide Communications with Theater Communications Group. Um, no, Director of Fieldwide Communications and Learning, oh. conferences. She does so many things. Um, um, please look up Devin Berkshire on the Theater Communications Group website. And Jonathan Schmidt Chapman, who's the Executive Director at Theater for Young Audiences USA. Uh, Roberta Pereira, who is the Producing Director of the Playwrights Realm. And we have Nicole Brewer returning, who's the Founder of Conscientious Theater Training, Theater Through an Anti-Racist Lens. So welcome them with me. Thank you so much for being here. Um, yes, so uh, I'm starting with Ed. I have asked him to share something. Do you want me to go to someone else? No, that's fine. Good, because your slides first. I don't see <laughs> yeah, yeah, please, please share the microphone. Um, so I, I have asked Ed to share this photograph that you see. And by the way, we will be publishing this slideshow um, on our social media and on our website so that people can access it and, and reference their notes. Um, but I have asked him to talk about a new 42 Studios dedicated family room that serves as a lactation space, caregiver, and child support room for artists. Yeah, you can applaud for that. Please engage. Please interact. Um, that's the energy I feel as well. Um, I'm going to allow him to, to talk about it further. I, I just want to draw your attention to the word dedicated and that it doesn't, it's not also a broom closet. This is a dedicated space. Um, and Ed, I would just love to hear from you the origins of this room and, and, and the story behind it. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so uh, at New 42, we, um, we're, we're a larger not-for-profit, and we have, um, of course, uh, the New Victory Theater, which is, um, of course, um, uh, rooted in families and, um, and um, children and youth and youth engagement. And, um, but, and we have uh, the Duke on 42nd Street and um, the New 42nd Street Studios. And uh, we've been doing this a long time, and we have um, such, a, such a variety of people that utilize our space. In particular, um, in the studios, we have uh, very small not-for-profit dance companies. We have uh, larger not-for-profits, and we have really, really big uh, commercial Broadway productions um, that come in, and film sometimes comes in rehearsal. So it's a, it's the um, the users of the space is just is 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 really it's a, the range is enormous. And um, one thing that we that we realized, and I will say that it, I, I think that it took us a little bit. I wish I wish we'd realize this sooner. Um, is that is that our client isn't necessarily our end user um, and, and the people who are actually using the space, the people that we're actually contracting with, maybe in the space for an invited presentation or maybe in the space you know, for a meet and greet or whatever, but the end user is actually the person who we, um, who, who we, who we thought we had thought everything through, but it's it, but it's really it's really wonderful to come to these things and to um, to to um, to uh, to realize what we can do more. And so, um, this room came into you know because we have because we have people at New Forty Two who have who have become parents, and um, and we did for a long time have different spaces that they would use. They were thankfully never broom closets, but they were but they weren't dedicated and they weren't and they weren't. Um, uh, always as as dignified as I wish that they they would have been. So um, we we got together and we we found this space that um, that wasn't that was really a, a lovely size, and um, sat down and thought, you know, what can we what can we do to 
to help the artist even further. Um, and um, so we came up with this space, and the first thing we did was 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 really put paint on it, and you know, and um, some 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 furniture from 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 Target. You know, it's not even it's not it was it was it was a pretty low cost but really high impact sort of venture that we did, and um, uh, it's been a big hit. And I would say I, I you know, for for a long time in the beginning, people were people were. Um, kept calling it a new mom room, and every time that would happen as a single um, father, I would, I would flinch a little bit and just say, we're gonna call it a new parent room, it's a new parent room. Um, and I would say that um, one of the things that kept coming up in my head was in thinking about the artists and thinking about the people who use the space is I wanted, is, is the word belonging, and the word, because people would say inclusive all the time and that, that was a great word, but the word that, that made me feel really warm was, was belonging. And I want everyone who, and New 42 wants everyone who comes into the New Victory or the Duke or, or the studios to, to not only feel like they're coming there to work, but to feel like that they, that they really belong. And that, they, and that, that not only are, is what, what they are doing and what they are creating um, incredibly important, but that um, their family is important to us also, and that they have this dedicated space um, to use. And I will say that as uh, that I was I was very um, sort of uh, it was just a unique, interesting story if you don't mind me sharing. But the first person who actually used the space um, was uh, was a gentleman who was performing in a Broadway show, and um, he came down and. and um, Turns out that his his wife was also in a was also in a show, um, and so she was rehearsing. And the, I, I think that their their mother, her, one of their mothers, was helping out with the baby. But um, the mother would bring the baby to the studios, and he was he shared with us that he's he he really wanted a space where he could feel comfortable to close the door and have privacy and actually um, remove his shirt and be able to feed the child and have that bonding moment um, in complete privacy. And it really, he was, it was bringing tears to his eyes and it brought tears to sort of all of our eyes. Um, it's just a, and he was just really, really grateful. And so, um, so it was just, it's, it, it's been wonderful. We have our regular employees that use the space. We have, um, and anyone who comes, into the, who comes into the studios can use the space. And you know, we're always looking to do it a little bit better and make sure that we can, um, make sure that we can make sure that everyone who knows that we have the space, so we're always trying to, you know, we have a suggestion box and um, everyone who comes into the space gets a security tag, so we're making sure, we, since we realized we give all this information to the clients, but since they're not the end user, it may not make it to the end user, all this information, the different things that we have. So, so right now we're coming up with different ways that we can really communicate with those people who walk into our doors. And one of the things that we're working on is just like, you know, a sticker on the back of their security tag that they can read and realize the different things that are in the building that they can use that they may not realize is, is here and they may not know to ask. So, I don't know. I, I love that. Um, this, I've entered this space personally, uh, and as a, as a parent, as someone who has been in a variety of spaces, you know, you and I have, have talked about this, to enter a space where there was enough thought to put paint on the wall, it tells me something about the, how much they've thought of me. Uh, and so when we were talking about value and humanity, this sort of low cost, high impact, is about anticipating saying, how can we show that we were compassionate and thoughtful? before someone asks for the need. I also want to point out the importance of you talking about um, how gendered our conversations around parenting can be in parent access. Um, and, and just so that we're all clear, we cannot have gender parity without including all genders as caregivers because then caregiving will continue to fall on the binary and continue to overwhelm women and individuals who identify off the binary, transgender, non-binary parents. Um, and so the understanding of when we have a dedicated space that you um, intentionally created to be gender inclusive, it allowed for a father to engage in caregiving as well and have that bond. Um, with his child. That's really beautiful. I, I would love to also talk about the actual items in the space because they are so smart. Um, they, they all have such utility. Can you just kind of give us a little, your target list? Sure, yeah. Because that's also very low cost, high yes, impact. Yes, yes, absolutely. There's, I mean, it's a, there's a very comfortable rocking chair. There is a, um, the, the tables are there and specifically so that people can bring photos of their children and, um, and put, them, put them there next to them while they're, um, while they're, while they're pumping or 
um, you know, just to, to, to have that around them. Uh, we have you know, pretty inexpensive Bluetooth speakers so that people can put on the different types of music that they want. Um, we do have two chairs in there so that two people could use it at once, and there's a privacy screen that's very, very um, light that if they, if they do want privacy, they can put it in between the two spaces. And then we you know, bought a small refrigerator to store milk if they need to that's separate from clearly the, the green room, and um, there's a um, you know, little, on the, on the front of the door is a vacancy or occupied little sign. And then in the hallway outside, we just put in a white noise machine just so that it's even a little bit that other level of privacy. Um, but we have, yeah, so that's the actual stuff in the room. Yeah, fi final, final pop quiz, um, and, and I, can, I can assist with details. But um, we're going to be talking in a little bit about RPI, but the room was also used um, for caregivers and children recently. Do you want to share a little bit about the impact that had? Yes, so over the summer, we had um, a performer come in and her, and she had a, a six or seven year old with her, um, her, her, her child, and um, their camp had been canceled for the day, and, but she had rehearsal, and so, and she did, she did have a caregiver with her, but they, and they were, they went to our green room, which was fine, but the green room can get very crowded, and you know, there's lots of other adults in there, and um, so, we, so we had them, uh, we said, you know, we have this other dedicated space, and so they went and sort of, you know, hung out there all day and drew me a thank you picture, and it was really <laughs> wonderful, and, um, and so, so we do that, and it, it, it's interesting because I've actually started uh, using it myself. I had, to, I had to have a conversation with my son's teacher, and we all have, uh, it's an open office, and I, I mean, I could have had the conversation in the open office. It wasn't bad, but I was just sort of like, I want a little privacy, so I'm going to go in here <laughs> into the new parent room and use it as a parent. Um, and, just, and just sort of, you know, it's, it, it's for me, it's like uh, our spaces are so, are, are built to inspire creativity, to be blank canvases, to, um, to, to be safe, and, and I think that as a parent, sometimes you have that, that thing in your head, that, that worry, that, that whatever it is in your head, and, that, and, if, and if this room can help take away any of that worry that you might have or any of that concern that you might have, then, then it's my job to provide it to you because, because then I am, I am helping make the space more accessible and take away that worry from your head so that it can maybe be more clear so that you can create even more in our other spaces. That's my job and it's important that I do that. Thank you. I'm gonna talk to that. Thank you. And just to, just to acknowledge this, this transference of value that instead of investing directly in the products, investing in the people who are the contributors of making the thing that we say we make. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, we're gonna shift to Devin um, oh. Berkshire. Her title's still wrong, but um, it's all it Googleable. <laughs> so um, uh, you can sh you share what you really do. And I, I uh, have been working with Devin uh, for a while. She is on our PAL steering committee as well. Um, but the work that she does with TCG um, as an advocate for parents um, is wonderful as well. Um, and I've asked her to talk about managing remote work um, and creating affinity spaces for support. So this is on the topic of flexible work arrangements, right? If someone's like, I need to work from home, w what does that look like and, and what can you share with us in terms of managing um, that? Yeah, as so I'm, I'm actually the director of conferences and fieldwide learning at TCG. Uh, so I'm on the team that produces and programs our national convenings. Um, and uh, when I first had a kid at TCG uh, is the year that our conferences became family friendly because I needed to bring my five month old and pump while I was producing the conference and was like, I shouldn't be the only one allowed to do this. <laughs> um, so that was the year we started talking about a family-friendly conference. And I think we still have a, a ways to go till it's truly feels family-friendly, but we do call it that still. Um, and, oh, okay, so when I f first became pregnant, um, I had a wonderful supervisor who is uh, still floating throughout the field, Daphina McMillan, um, who was not at the time on the family track and, um, I just remember uh, sitting down with her before I had my child and um, telling her that I wanted to work 
from home one day a week once my child was born and I came back from maternity leave. And she did not bat an eye and said, totally. Um, and just kind of went to bat for me for, to our leadership and uh, to our executive leaders. And I just, I have to lift her up for that and also just put that into the space as a reminder that um, it's not just other parents and caregivers who can be our best advocates in our workspaces. Um, she was my supervisor and she was not a mom um, and not planning on being a mom anytime soon and uh, frankly younger than me. And <laughs> she, uh, she was my biggest advocate during that time. Um, and I needed one because when I started this process at TCG, I didn't have the same level of sort of access to our executive leaders and uh, I needed an advocate and she, she was there for me and so I, I, she empowered me to start advocating for myself. And then um, as she left and I was sort of her successor in that role, uh, I, I, I kind of try to pay that forward uh, a bit. And so I do think that is kind of like the cycle of advocacy in our organizations that we can uh, start and perpetuate um, uh, starting now, if we haven't already. Um, so that, that began my journey of just sort of becoming a partial remote worker. And we have had a leadership transition since then. So I did have to sort of re-advocate for letting myself keep that schedule, even as my son grew and my childcare needs were different than they were at the time when I asked for that. Um, now it's honestly just about, um, it's just about making the schedule a little bit more manageable. It's not about a specific childcare need, which it sort of was originally. Um, and uh, now I'm like, known sort of as the mom at TCG who works one day a week, but something in that started creating a lot of, a lot more conversation, I think, in our workplace for more remote working. Um, technology obviously has made this much easier than it used to be. Um, and it's interesting, I do have conversations with uh, mothers at TCG who are mothers of older kids who have been mothers at TCG since their kids were younger who asked for this decades ago and were told straight up no. And um, so we've come, we've come a ways from then, but also um, there is some friction almost between, um, I would say between that generation and, and mine and the ones below me, uh, the, the, younger, the, the younger generation even than me, in, in these workplace practices, partly because of that prejudice faced decades ago or a decade ago, um, and the barriers, um, the barriers put up for parents back then, and sort of this feeling of, well, I, I managed to raise two kids and had to commute into work every day, so you know, why are we making kind of special accommodations for parents now? Um, and I've had a lot of interesting conversations around that question uh, with, um, with parents of grown children. And I do think, um, I do think we've, we've had some really productive conversations around why uh, that particular precedent and the way that things have always been should never be a reason for just keeping things the way that they are. Um, and I do have to say, like, this is the, the ability to remote work in today's workplace. I mean, I know this doesn't apply to theater artists as much. People who are visiting artists and who are um, freelance artists, this is more about people who work in organizations on a day-to-day -day basis. But this really is a no-cost, um, high-impact solution. Uh, it does not have to cost anything. In our workplace, we utilize Google now, like, like it is the central system that we use. It's where all our files are kept, so I can do that anywhere. Um, Microsoft now you can access online. So uh, as long as your systems are sort of updated, there is zero reason why you can't do a, a ton of your work from home unless you are in particular roles that keep you in the workplace, in which case I do think uh, we should empower our folks who, because we have these conversations at TCG, 
there are some roles as we start talking more and more about telecommuting and making that more of an option. There are definitely roles that ha that just have less less, a less access to that option than others. And we've started the conversations within departments about making sure that it is accessible for everyone at least sometimes. There is no reason it can't be for everyone at least sometimes. And that, the remote work is, is a thing, but also we've started bringing our kids to work more. I mean, that was just when I was visiting on maternity leave. I didn't actually bring my like two month old baby to work, but uh, uh, other, other than to visit. But, um, but I have brought my kid to work and set him up. I mean, I've just been so touched about the actually how open my colleagues have been to that and our executive leaders have been to that. There was such a warm welcome. Um, and I do think this is new. I think that this has come a little with our new leadership. There was such a warm welcome to my like four, five, he was five at the time, four, four-year-old son. Uh, in my workplace and that the fact that they like took one of our central meeting rooms and our operations manager lowered the table so he could have the meeting room for a day and the table was his height mm -hmm. and uh and and just like kind of put the chairs on the side and that became sort of like his reserve space for the, or our reserve space for the day um i've been in in theater workplaces i always lift up cleveland playhouse because um they I walked into their space when I did a conference site visit in 2015 and I, I needed to, I was on a site visit and then the first thing I needed to do was pump. And I had to go into their space and be like, I know I'm just here to tour your space, but <laughs> I'm somewhere where I can pump. I gave them a heads up via email and they're like, yeah, 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 we got you covered. And I'm like bracing myself to get put into uh, you know, a bathroom or a, a, a backstage or something. And they open up the door to a room that looked a lot like yours, and they had a changing table and like a, um, a play mat, and it was there for young children and for uh, new parents, but they also called it a privacy space for other employees to be able to use, so there was sort of company-wide buy-in. And they had a separate room for parents who needed to bring their kids to work called the family room that had a workstation set up and like a play space for a parent to be able to have a private space where their kids could sort of be loud and play and they could also work sitting right beside them. And this was like four years ago and this blew me away. Um, so I do think remote work is, is sort of one solution and it's huge for parents with schedules that are all over the place, but also the ability to bring your kids into work when you actually need to be in the office, but your kid randomly has a, a, a day off school that you can't figure out why it's a day off school, but like, <laughs> does anyone know what I'm talking about? We have these random days for like, um, uh, Chancellor's Day, like what is that? Um, so. <laughs> So, yeah, that, that has to be something that I think for, for truly inclusive, like, family-friendly practices in a workplace, both things have to be possible. Um, creating affinity spaces. I mean, Rachel and I were talking about this. This is actually sort of aspirational for us. We do a lot of affinity spaces at TCG conferences around identity, but also around um, professional role in the field. Um, and actually, I think it was 2015, actually co-facilitated with my colleague here, Rob, um, we did, uh, I think our first, I wouldn't call it an affinity space, but our parent, a parent-focused conversation. And we've since had some affinities. We had a mother's affinity space in Portland, which I co-facilitated with Rachel and our friend Kanisha. And um, uh, affinity spaces hold a certain value for the folks in them. Um, that I don't think I'll get too far into. I mean, we all kind of know the value of solidarity, and I think they can be used in a workplace for sure. I've thought about creating a sort of caregiver affinity space at TCG and just sort of haven't gotten to it yet. Um, but I think there is, there's a value in solidarity and in sort of mutual support outside the realm of kind of judgment from our peers. Um, and then there is a value in like action planning and uh, sort of, um, movement building even within a workplace um, and group uh, sort of um, advocating for each other and, and planning on how to do that more in a space. So I do think that affinity spaces in a workplace, if you were to start one, can be sort of multi-purpose um, and you sort of have to decide what your affinity, affinity space would be for.
But we do have affinity spaces at TCG internally in our culture. Um, we have one for people of color at TCG. We have one for women at TCG. Um, we have one for artists at TCG. Um, so affinity spaces by and large in workspaces, I'm, I'm like a big advocate for, but a caregiver one is something that anyone can do. Um, if your workplace does buy into the notion of affinity spaces and wanna make room for that kind of sort of employee personal development, which I'm also a big advocate for, um, then that is one place to really start. Other than that, I would also advocate for forming just like a discussion group around how your organization can make, um, can engage in family-friendly practices sort of at large or caregiver-friendly practices at large, which ultimately do kind of benefit everyone at the organization, whether they're a caregiver or not. So I'll stop there. It's pretty good. Um, you may engage, I saw some people go. <laughs> Go for it. Thank you. She was so generous. We can be too. Um, I also know, um, th so she's speaking very passionately. I know firsthand from the work that she's done and the work that we've engaged in together that this works. I just want to address, I can read mine, some alarm bells that are going off in your heads. Um, insurance, liability of the space, children in the space, dot, dot, dot. Um, first of all, Broadway babysitters, just to give another shout out, they have mobile insurance that covers any space that their caregivers occupy. So there are organizations, and if you're in, your, you're in New York City, Here's an example of one you can use where their caregivers have the insurance that your space needs in order for a child to be taken care of. Um, also, if you are attached to a university, you need to double check that against the um, university's HR policy. Um, but I also want to say when we're talking about um, children in the space and, and you're in, a, in an area of the country where um, an organization like Broadway Babysitters is not available, um, take a look at your HR handbook, take a look at your insurance together either with your HR or your general manager and say, does this cover unaccompanied minors or is it okay to have accompanied minors in the space? It depends so much on whether or not the guardian is constantly present with the child. Um, so I just encourage institutions, if you're terrified of the liability conversation, still engage because there is a plethora of options that could create support for the parent even if you can't imagine it right away when they ask for it. I'm also going to advocate for this idea of um, mobile, uh, remote work. Since Devin and I have been talking about it and I've been engaging with different groups about it, remote work helps parents, but it's one of those solutions that has interconnected access possibilities. Think of people who have limited mobility access when you create a policy in your organization that you are allowed to engage digitally what you're saying is that you are making spaces as accessible as possible and when there's a limitation you still want to create a way for your people to show up and be engaged and some some advanced player tips if you're doing remote access start with a personal check-in and always end with a shared task list so everyone knows what's expected of them and that goes back to hr's write everything down um amazing and and actually what you said um what you said in terms of don't accept this is just the way it's always been done, um, that's going to come back to us as well. So if everyone holds on to that nugget. Um, I'm going to uh, also now shift to Jonathan Schmidt Chapman, who is the Executive Director for Theater for Young Audiences USA. And I did get that one right, right? Um, and he's going to talk to us about um, not managing remote work. That's a copy paste. Look at the picture. So um, I'll this, talk about that too. This, thank, yeah, you may, um, as it inspires you. Um, I'm going to allow Jonathan to share with us what this is an image of, but it's wonderful information information in regard to um, maternity and paternity leave survey for theater for young audiences. Thank you. Um, it's such an honor to be here. And I, I speak to you today as an artist, an organizer, and a parent. My husband and I are, are parents to a, a, an almost three-year-old. Um, so before I get into those numbers, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about Theater for Young Audiences USA. So I represent about 800 members around the country, professionals, theaters, artists who are focused on young people specifically. Um, and I think the first thing to kind of unpack is when I say children's theater, some people in this room, depending on your point of view, probably have a stereotype or an image in your head, and it may be lesser than art for tall people or taller people. <laughs> um, and I think this conversation needs to include a conversation around how we value young people, how we value, value children, um, what kind of art we think they deserve, because we, within our industry, discriminate against kids or have biases against kids and families that impact policy. So when we think about, well, it's just for kids, it doesn't have to be that high quality. Um, they don't, it's not really art, it's for kids. 
um, I'm gonna get my equity card doing that show for kids so that I can make the real art. Um, all of these things that are baked into the way we, we think about young people within our industry affect policies for kids, affect, affect the way we think about kids and families. And when we look internationally, the ways we view childhood within the arts and creating for young people is much more fluid, depending on where you are, than in our country, which is very siloed. And we see the industries as distinct. So I just feel like we need to throw that out in the room first. Um, our theaters within the TYUSA network spend their time very thoughtfully thinking about how do we serve families? How do we create art that speaks to young people um, age appropriately? How do we challenge them? How do we inspire them? How do we create spaces that are uniquely family friendly? So there's a whole lot of expertise within the TYA field that I think doesn't necessarily uh, transfer over to the, there's no good term for it, the adult theater, the you know, theater that is for adults. Um, so one offer I wanna make is that I feel like we can create more symbiotic relationships between the industries around this conversation and we'll get into that in, in a little bit. Um, so, so this year TYA USA uh, launched our first national study and a collection of data around the industry, specifically of TYA. TCG has been doing this for a long time. And when I took my position about two years ago, um, I was asked all the time for the, those numbers around the industry and had nothing. Um, and was shocked to find that there really hadn't been a comprehensive data collection around the professional uh, theater for young audiences industry nationwide. So we just published a study um, on all kinds of statistics around uh, the theater's business practice and learned a lot. Things that we, uh, some things that we inherently know, but now we have numbers to support, and other things that uh, we didn't know, and now we have data backing it up. So one of the, the things we learned or wanted to learn about was paid maternity and paternity leave, and that's, this is broken down by budget size. So you can see the percentage of theaters within each of those budget categories. Uh, we have 50 theaters responding to this question. 60 theaters were eligible to take our survey, um, and so it was a pretty high response rate. And a, and a pretty even breakdown among those budget categories. Um, and it's interesting, we were talking about this uh, earlier, to see that drop when theaters get to a certain budget level. Um, that's just an interesting thing. I think you know, one of my assumptions is maybe that's about the uh, conversation we were having earlier around, well, we, if we offer it to you, we have to offer it to everyone. Um, and as the theaters uh, scale up and organizations get bigger, that potentially gets harder to offer those policies. This is outside of paid vacation time. So this is specifically paid leave. Um, and I think, uh, you know, unfortunately, this conversation with Theater for Young Audiences needs to be uh, contextualized within a conversation about the financial realities within the TYA sector. So uh, other data that came back in this study demonstrates how as an industry, we're trying to produce theater at the same uh, level with the same structures, with the same unions as theater for taller people. Um, and yet our ticket prices are uh, well below 50% of what we can earn based on what um, our colleagues can earn. Ba you know, ticket pricing um, and structures around subscriptions, um, ability to have donors because young families, even though they are direct patrons, are not necessarily giving um, philanthropically the way our colleagues are able to build a base of donor, uh, of donor engagement. Um, so, and, and the way the funding community looks at children <laughs> and doesn't see us as, as art alongside our, um, our counterparts that are applying for similar funding from theater foundations. So all of these things add up to the fact that, that even if our organizations want to support parents, they're unable to, the, the, the budget structures are such that we're already kind of in a dis dis disadvantaged place structurally. M most of our theaters don't have HR people. Um, you know, we're unable to really provide those structures even if we want to. And so the conversations I've been having with PAL have really led to TYA USA thinking about how do we push the TYA field forward because arguably we should be leading this conversation. Our organizations are structured around the best policies for our families. We're constantly thinking about how to serve our families and children as audiences. We should be making it we should be, be the boundary breaking um, in terms of supporting artists and professionals working in the industry. So it shouldn't mean that once you become a parent, it's no longer possible to be an artist making work for young people, right? Uh, we should be including the parents, artists who become parents in that conversation. Um, and what's interesting is a lot of our theaters are thinking about how to include young people in the rehearsal process, 
or the development room. Children are brought into rehearsal processes or workshops or readings, and yet we're not quite connecting the dots around how to create rehearsal spaces for artists with kids. Um, and, and potentially even creating processes where artists as parents can create work for kids, including their children in development and what that could look like. I think that could be a model for us. Um, the other point is that for um, child matinees, for example, at regional theaters, at, at theaters for adults, there could be more collaboration between TYA theaters and regional theaters in the same cities that don't talk to each other right now yeah. around joint programs. You know, rather than just offering childcare during a matinee, what if a program was built led by teaching artists so that kids are actually engaged in something that's meaningful artistically while their parents are watching a, a matinee uh, or their caregivers are watching a matinee. And, and what would that mean to create a, a vibrant space within a theater for adults that is in partnership with a children's theater locally? How, what can we learn from each other? And I think those, those bridges need to be built in a way that right now we're com I, I'm seeing across the industry that the children's theater sector and the uh, adult theater sector are totally siloed within the same cities, including New York. Um, and finally, so we have a festival and conference as well annually. Um, we present about 12 shows for young people that professionals come in to see. It's a networking conference for professionals in the TYA industry. And it's a really weird thing to have like 300 adults watching a show for kids. Um, and that's like the world I always have lived in. Um, and this past conference, we said, how do we make our conference truly family friendly? We have the opportunity, we're, we're hosting our conference at the Alliance Theater, which is, I think, a real leader in thinking about families and kids as part of an institution alongside the New Victory. These are two of like, the most uh, forward-thinking venues around this issue. Um, the Alliance also has a, a similar space uh, to the New 42s. They have a toddler takeover festival every year where they have um, hundreds of families with kids under five that take over the whole Woodruff Art Center. And our conference overlapped with that festival. So for the first time, we offered a family package for attendees mm. who could bring their kids to the shows at the conference and sessions and take part in the programming. And we saw a huge response. We had about 30 families come and professionals who have said, I've come to this conference for years. I've never brought my family. This was a totally different experience to get to bring my kids to a, in, to a professional space where I'm normally you know, thinking about my kids at home watching work that they could connect to. Um, and so by providing that invita invitation, we were able to connect those dots and think more about how to support, think about our professionals within our industry as parents themselves. Um, I'll stop there. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to, for, for once, ask you to hold your applause because I'm going to keep diving in here. Um, Jonathan and I have had wonderful conversations on this topic. Um, and, and the word that I, I want to highlight is intergenerational and how as a field we lack intergenerational conversations. Um, and to connect this to buy-in, right, the language, let's, let's also know that what's ringing in my head that I hear all the time from um, theaters of, all the way up to production contracts and commercial level, how do we bring more young people into the theater? How do we get them to buy our tickets? And the problem is when you tell the children that they're not allowed in the space as they're growing up, when you tell them that their theater is different, from our theater, why should they, once they turn 18, jump to your box office if they haven't felt included there since the beginning? And so this understanding of, it's not just about audience engagement and engaging with the community, it's engaging with an intergenerational community. This idea of family packages, um, I, I think is absolutely brilliant. Come enjoy this conference with your family. I would jump at, because that sounds so much easier than finding a babysitter who I'm paying. Um, I also want to lift up a Seed Art Share in Raleigh, North Carolina. Everyone at home, Google them. You can Google them here. Um, they develop curated programming for children to go along with the theater shows the parents are seeing um, so that when the families go home, they talk about the art together. Um, and also want to lift up our pal chief rep in Raleigh, uh, North Carolina. Um, Johanna uh, Maynard Edwards, who is the executive director of Women's Theater Festival Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, their festivals are just to affirm this, this concept that Jonathan's proposing um, is so doable. Um, they created a family accessible uh, conference um, festival uh, this year and Seed Art Share came alongside them to create programming. So um, Pal is very excited about engaging in this intergenerational conversation because 
when we succeed at building this network, we can help facilitate those conversations and imagine um, how much more robust our understanding of the art is that your people create when we have a stake in it, as we should. You know, there shouldn't be that budget gap either. Um, so uh, th thank you so much for that. Um, is there anything else you want to add in terms of, um, you said that there was a, an outlier on the sheet, or did you feel that was covered on the budget survey? Oh, no, I think that was covered. Um, yeah, I'm just curious. I think that, that now providing statistics for the TYA field will yeah. hopefully lead to conversations about a lot of these numbers increasing or thinking about, well, our colleagues are doing it. How can we do that? Um, that was kind of the goal of this study was to unite a very siloed field mm. um, in terms of thinking about how we're, where we, we're ranking on a lot of these policies um, and compare it to our colleagues within the TCG network and thinking about where we fit as a subset of a larger industry um, because some of the realities are different, but there's a lot we can share. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, now you may applaud, I won't hold your hands anymore. So brilliant, so good. Um, we're gonna jump to Nicole, I, I shifted the order on you, apologies. Um, but this is to, <laughs> surprise. Um, this is to go, uh, Nicole Brewer, who we spoke to earlier, founder of Conscientious Theater Training, Theater Through an Anti-Racist Lens. Um, I've asked Nicole to share a story of her experience when she um, asked for access uh, for um, something to be done differently, and the answer that came back was a semi-no because um, it was it had always been done that way. So, could you share with me what that example was and how how it worked out? Sure. So, um, I was directing, and um, thank God in this case for white supremacy culture, workplace culture, in terms of a culture of exhaustion, because um, there was some miscommunication between these different individuals. Uh, at this organization, which allowed me to then slide in with my need and then ignore emails saying otherwise, right? Um, to get what I needed. So basically it was around, you know, that rehearsal schedule being at nighttime and um, how for my family, uh, I'm the strong parent in my family and it just means like all the logistical things like I take care of, right? Um, and so it's very disruptive when I'm gone at nighttime for the, that period of time. And for this particular production, it actually just wasn't necessary for me to rehearse at nighttime. Um, and so I made the request to rehearse during the day. And that was pushed back with like, well, no one has asked for that in 20 years. And that's the email I ignored. Uh, <laughs> And then we were able to rehearse during the day, right? Which was much better for me to rehearse during the time for that particular uh, organization that my kids were already in school and allowed me to then be present for them um, at nighttime, which is just important in my family for maintaining those kind of rituals um, while still allowing me to practice my art. So yeah, that was one instance of just going, oh, okay, I can actually ask for what I need. And I will preface this by saying that that decision was based off reading an article um, that I had just read around the like Powell curated series. And it was just present in my mind that that is actually something that I could ask for, right? So um, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, and it ended up working in my favor. So did you have, you had another question? Right, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a follow up question. Okay. can jump right into it. Um, that's so beautiful. So um, it, that access was created for you because you, you made it. That access was created for you because you made a decision to choose not to abide by the way that it's always been done. And I want to challenge the room that whenever that phrase comes up in your own mind or comes up in conversation um, to offer the question, the next question. Yeah, but why? And aren't there more than one way to do things? And just like, it's okay to throw the ball in the other person's court. Um, I, I've also asked Nicole to share, you know, once that access in the space is created, to share an example um, of how she makes access for other people and why, um, in terms of um, one of the examples that she shared with me, I've done an interview with her, and put it on the podcast, I'm so excited, um, in terms of when people show up uh, late into the space and, and what's behind your decision for how you treat that moment. Yeah, so when I'm directing things or even facilitating, um, I, I want people to feel seen 
And I want them to be able to bring their full authentic selves to whatever it is that we have gathered to do, right? And some of the things that have been done to me around lateness um, carry this huge weight of shame, right? Um, that I should have been able to you know, be there on time. And I know that when I went through um, my BFA training, it was just like hammered in that, you know, to be on time was to be late, right? And that we needed to be 15 minutes early. Um, and so we could just have this kind of presence around time. Then life happened and um, I had some kids and sometimes my kids are just hell bent on us not making it to where we need to be, right? Um, on time, and again, there was just a lot of shame with that, showing up with spittle, or the anxiety around, come on, let's just go. Like I have this phrase now where I tell my kids, walk with purpose, we have, we know, just walk with purpose. Um, so I would show up to things constricted, jaw tight, body tight, spirit tight, who's clocking me, who's checking me, and do I have one of those three acceptable reasons for being late? right, um, that I could give to someone and then they can like give me the freedom to just be. So I didn't want to uphold that. And so wherever people are coming from, I welcome them. I say welcome, right? I let them put their stuff down and I just check in with them um, and have like a little exercise around that. But I think that that's really important for just setting folks agency around you take care of what you need to take care of. Please don't skip a meal so you can be here on time and then be here you know, hungry and upset. Don't rush your kids out the door um, without having to make whatever your ritual is with your kids because you feel like the time is more important or getting to the job is more important. Um, and sometimes we just need um, unstructured time before we transition into the next thing, or at least I'll speak from the eye. Sometimes I need unstructured time before I transfer into the next headspace to process and be present. And so for me, um, it's very, very, very important to kind of like address, and I'm gonna use a phrase um, that came from um, this playwright James Imes, who I absolutely love. James goes, well, what's the DNA behind that? Mm. So for me really going, oh, I'm upholding this thing around time. Oh, I understand the DNA around this like white supremacy culture and this culture of exhaustion and this culture of production, right? As seen through the eyes of prejudice and bias and racism. Wait a minute. <laughs> you know, there's another way to be. And I have found that people are really receptive to not having to categorize their life under like someone was sick, I was sick, traffic, death. I feel like I'm missing one. You know what I mean? Um, train, train. Oh, the train, yes, or the train, yeah. Um, yeah, that's so beautiful. And, and to just to echo what you're saying, like to understand, like I offered to ask the question, well, but why do we do it that way? I think so often um, the phrase time is money, whether we're consciously or subconsciously using it comes to mind. So when someone's 10 minutes late, they've cost you money and money is already tight. And it's because we are coming from a place in our field where resources are so limited that this person for them to cost you in a way that's not productive feels like an attack. It feels like it's compromising your room. And I would encourage us to disassociate those two things, where actually time is a resource. And if that person, if you trust that person and they show up and they have borrowed some of your time, they've borrowed some of your resource, but if they need it to contribute to the room, they're actually gonna be giving it back, right? Um, yeah, thank you. And I've, I've, I, I've always like had a more flexible understanding but this intentional word welcome. I just thank you for sharing, because um, I use it now. Um, and uh, we're, uh, yes, we're jumping to you. Um, so, uh, Roberta and I recently worked on a project at a Playwrights Realm called the Radical Parent Inclusion Project. I'm going to kind of pause on that for a little bit because um, one of my favorite stories in terms of uh, creative problem solving um, that Roberta has is um, how she shaped her leave. And so, I've, I've asked her to um, share that story and kind of break down what that looks like. 
Yeah, so first thing I just want to say that just being in the space and actually listening to all these stories is very special to me because my daughter, who's now two, she's sitting on my lap in that picture. Uh, actually, her first show that she saw was actually in this very room. About a year ago, I brought her to see the mobile units, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, and we sat right there. And can you take a one-year-old to see Shakespeare? Apparently you can, because I did, and it was all right. Everybody <laughs> survived. <laughs> and she she loved it. Um, and, and so, yeah, so talking about specifically about the reserve and leave policy. So at my organization, the Playwrights Realm, um, I was not the first person to have a baby at the organization. I actually have heard uh, of, uh, I will not name this specific theater, but a theater that's been around for a long time like over 40 years, I think. And apparently they never had a pregnant employee in all that time, and so they do not have a maternity leave policy. True story. But um, that was not the case in my theater, although we are a much smaller theater. Uh, but when I became pregnant, I suddenly, it was like, what do we do? Like, we actually don't have a formal policy. It was like an ad hoc thing. Like, when people had the need, we talked to them specifically. And so I, I, I started thinking about this and speaking to my artistic director, who's not a parent, but was very open to this. We are an organization that's led by two women, and so that's also a very unique thing, uh, sadly, but true. Um, and the idea, we wanted to supplement, there's obviously in New York, uh, not obviously, but I hope most of you know, the, the, uh, parent, the parental leave, the FM, what is it called? FMLA. FMLA. Um, and it doesn't cover all of it. It's, it's going, you know, a little bit better each year. But uh, the, so what we decided to do as an organization is that we were gonna put in our policy, like this was gonna become part of our HR handbook, uh, that the realm would cover, would make, it, would make it whole. So whatever FMLA would cover, the realm would cover the rest of it as well for anybody. And actually for all the reasons, the FMLA is for adoption, for there's a couple of other, for actually taking care of elderly relatives as well or somebody with a, with a sickness. And so we decided to cover all of that. And how are we gonna be able to cover that? Uh, you know, talking about going back to the board and saying, uh, the way that we have built the realm is that we have built a reserve. And so every year when we have a little bit of extra money, we started creating this reserve. And over 12 years, this reserve has built up. And the idea for this reserve originally was uh, for creative risk taking is what we call. So whenever we decide to do a show that it's a little bit bigger, you know, like, yes, we're doing the wolves. There's 10 actresses in it. So how are we going to pay for that? We could Get, uh, take from this reserve if necessary. But then my idea in terms of creativity was how could we look at this reserve not just for the creative risk taking, how could it be for other things as well? Because obviously the, the difficult thing for planning for a lot of these things is that you could have a year that nobody needs that and then you could have a year that five employees need that. So you have to have the flexibility in your budget to be able to accommodate that. Um, and I love flexible budgeting, as Rachel knows. <laughs> um, and so the idea was that we would have ability, and so we wouldn't have to mess with our bottom line, right? So this was something that was totally out. And when I presented it to our board, the board was going to ask all these questions. And then I explained, I was like, let me get through my presentation, then I'll answer any questions at the end. I got through the whole thing, and I was reserving. And then I saw, I was like, any questions? And there was no questions. Yeah. Everybody, all the questions that you're asking, like we cover them, and everybody thinks that's great. And so that has been a policy that we have had in place now for a few years, uh, which has been wonderful. Uh, and another thing I want to add, too, that's a little bit outside of this, but um, since the topic is creativity, I was looking around at this panel, and I actually have literally collaborated in a way or another with everybody in this panel, right? From doing multiple shows with Ed and doing panels for the two of you, and then sharing some of my data with you. Uh, and so I think that this is the other thing that's really powerful in this room, and like we're sitting here and everybody's there, but there's moments where it's like, I would say connect. Because I think that this is where, like sometimes you call somebody, and I remember calling Ed and being like, oh, I wanna do this childcare matinee and I need a room because it needs to be in the middle of the day. And I thought it was gonna be a whole thing. And Ed was like, oh yeah, that sounds good. And I was like, 
that's the call, that's it. <laughs> um, so what I will say is like have these conversations, like the people, and the, the fact that everybody who's in this room already, I, I would say means that they care about this and they know this is an important subject. So like let's have these conversations and see how we can share resources, share uh, even like experiences, good and bad experiences, because I think that that's how we advance the whole field and you know, theater of all ages. I think that that's why it's so important to have you here as well. So that's the other thing that I wanted to just say out loud, because this is, is one of the most powerful things I think it's gonna be, come out of today. Absolutely, um, and that, that gets at the heart of why we're meeting and, and how you can use these breaks. And you know, we thought about making lunch, which is coming up in a little bit, like also a work session. <laughs> You're like, oh my gosh. Um, but we've, we've allowed for space for you all to talk with each other. And it's because by developing these relationships, if you feel alone in your organization, if you feel alone in these conversations, because you're a part of this room, even if you're watching online, you're not alone anymore. Um, start to engage with the people who are here and, and have those conversations. And PAL is committed. You know, like when you go back to your offices and this is not even on the agenda, PAL is committed to always having it number one. So you always have a resource hub to come back to and we can help reconnect you with some of these people as well. We're about to slip into the Q&A. If I could get a time check, perfect. You all uh, hit it right on the head. Um, time is a resource. <laughs> um, but um, I just wanna do a final call to action um, just to go back to Theatre for Young Audiences USA, that um, for regional theaters, if you know that there's a Theatre for Young Audience member in your city and in your area, reach out, start having the conversation, um, connect with Jonathan, connect with myself, because we're ready to start talking about what does this look like. Um, so, so look them up, make a phone call. You might find some really wonderful collaborators and friends. All right, um, thank you so much for watching online. Engage on social media, and we're going to go to... Um, spy mode.